When we were children, back in the bad old days when you were allowed to be an unlicensed child, we would eagerly await our annual release from that terrible impediment to actually learning anything known as grade school. We could barely contain ourselves as June rolled around and summer vacation grew ever so gradually nearer. For us, summer vacation was a great time to learn brand new things, interesting things, fun things, not that boring stuff they taught you in schools. You see, summer vacation meant visiting the public library, and summer vacation at the public library meant the summer reading program. As far as we were concerned, the summer reading program was the greatest thing ever invented anywhere. Get this, in exchange for just reading a book, you could win prizes. So exciting was the prospect that in first grade we read 50 whole books in one summer. And not just any 50 books, 50 books of literary merit. Oh yes. And how do we know they were 50 books of literary merit? Because we got a diploma from librarian Rachel Maxwell for doing it, and it says literary merit right there in bold type and everything. But wait, there's more. We also got a congratulatory certificate from the governor, and a polished rock, and a certificate for mini golf, just for reading 50 books of literary merit in one summer. Can you believe it? We were going to do that anyway. As the years went by, three major areas of interest began to appear in our reading. First, as any kid in grade school can tell you, dinosaurs are the most interesting thing to read about, bar none. And we had favorite dinosaur books we would read over and over again each year. In our prime, we could tell you all sorts of details about dinosaurs that no one aside from the author knew even up to and including the on-again, off-again Brontosaurus. Don't Pluto my dinosaur. Area number two of special interest didn't have a name at the time, at least not one known to us. Today, though, it is called cryptozoology. Bigfoot, the Abominable Snowman, and Nessie were the big three, and we'd devour any information we could get on them. Like the dinosaur, we became miniature experts on them. From the Patterson-Gimlin film, to the Shipton photograph at Menlung Glacier, to the surgeon's photograph, we knew the evidence and sightings reports back to front. Mind you, we couldn't add up or multiply for beans, but we knew our cryptids. But the third and final area of special interest was particularly special. It made us sit up and take notice whenever the library added a new volume to the shelves. They fired the imagination and took us to a fantastic time when the nation was still young and growing, and it fascinated us to think we lived in a place where such things existed. Explorers and adventurers, giant men, strange beasts, and amazing feats enthralled us with their magic. Best of all, they featured true, actual people you could read about in the history books, which made school history books way better, too. And, just to give it that coating of extra authenticity, the stories we read were told by people who had actually been there and witnessed the events themselves. In person. No, really. Promise. Because that's how tall tales work. This is GM Word of the Week. And I'm Fiddleback. Let's get a couple of things out of the way first. This is going to be a two-parter. In this, the first part, we'll talk about the tall tales surrounding legendary, but real, people. In part two, we'll discuss the other sort of tall tale. The ones about giants like Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox, and mythical beasts like the Hodag and Sidehill Gouger. So there's that to look forward to. The second thing to cover right up front is that tall tales are found all over the world, across many cultures and nations. They cover a rainbow of different styles, sensibilities, and national traditions, from crooked mick of the Spiwa in Australia to European and particularly German stories about Baron Munchausen and his exploits. They're all very fun, funny, and exciting stories. But for these two episodes, we're going to be focusing on those tall tales that come out of the American experience. We'll save the others to be sprinkled into future episodes as needed. 
You're probably familiar with the nature of tall tales. No matter how ridiculous they may sound, how far-fetched the things that happen, how patently ridiculous the scenarios being explained are, nor how inaccurate the facts of the matter may be, a tall tale is always unequivocally absolutely true at all times, and shame on the person who says otherwise. Now, it may be that the truth is, shall we say, only symbolically true. But that is still a kind of truth nonetheless, and so qualifies, and therefore makes the tale teller beyond reproach. No one actually lies during the course of a tall tale, though they may exaggerate ever so slightly. This is an important rule to remember. It's all in the name of making the story better for the listener, and that is a generous and kind thing for the storyteller to do. You should be thanking them, not looking for fault. The other important thing to keep in mind is that for the most part, a tall tale is not a legend. Oh no, legends are things that happened to people long ago dead and gone. And not just like in the last century dead and gone, we're talking about long, long, long ago. If we tell you about the Trojan horse, that's a legend. No direct chain of oral tradition remains from the original witness of the events to the present day. But with a tall tale, there's a direct line from the tale teller to the origin of the tale. Sure, they might have heard it from a friend of a friend of a friend, but that line is theoretically traceable to the very same person who witnessed these totally true events at the time they happened. That's as important as the fact that they are all true, for a certain value of true. Most often, tall tales come to us as part of an oral tradition. Oral tradition just means that they're the sorts of stories you might pass along by word of mouth, say, around a campfire, that have a particular importance to the cultural tradition of the person telling the tale and those hearing it. Typically, in telling, hearing, and then learning to tell the tales yourself, you are helping to culturally prepare the next generation for the duties and expectations of the culture they are growing up in. By sharing those same tales over and over again, the next generation learns how to be part of the community and what the community values from its members. Without the passing along of oral traditions, members of a community can feel isolated and eventually become outsiders to their own culture. Tall tales grow in the telling, though. By their very nature, they encourage a certain amount of one-upsmanship as they are repeated to a group. It's no good following a story about how Mose the Fireboy of New York's Fire Company 49 could lift trolley cars over his head if you then tell a story about how Mose also lifted a trolley car over his head this one other time. It's not being true to the storytelling tradition. Mose better get out there and at least lift two trolley cars, one in each hand, and throw them from Brooklyn to the Bronx with his entire fire crew hanging on for dear life just so they could get to the next alarm in time to save the widows and orphans. And wouldn't you know it, it landed right in line with the tracks, too. They just coasted right to the front door and hopped out. Had the fire out in five minutes flat. Is it true? Well, it's true enough. Mose existed. He was based on a firefighter in the 1800s named Mose Humphrey. And if he'd been capable of such a feat, he'd certainly have done it. Because that's what firefighters do, you see. They act bravely and heroically even when circumstances are against them, doing whatever it takes to save life and property. That story, importantly, reinforces that idea. And that is certainly something firefighters need to have reinforced. Equally importantly, you fulfilled your end of the bargain, which is that when you hear a story that's been entertaining, you're obliged to return the favor and be at least as entertaining as the original teller. Preferably more so. There are some significant dangers in propagating a tall tale version of a real person, though. By their very nature, tall tales tend to gloss over the actual details of a person's life, both good and bad. Elements which are unpleasant or distasteful to the palate of the current tale teller tend to disappear into the background, if not completely. As each tale is reformed to become more pleasing to the current audience, bits of actual history can become lost in the telling if they aren't deemed important enough to the story at hand. Or worse, they're changed wholesale in the name of a better story. Folklore would have you believe that Daniel Boone was a trailblazer of westward expansion which led to the settlement of Kentucky. 
Always an outsider, uncomfortable with the progress of civilization, he'd often pull up stakes with his family and move further and further into the unexplored wilderness until he felt comfortably far enough away, at least until civilization caught up again. Possibly the greatest woodsman in United States history, he eventually cleared a trail through the Cumberland Gap that opened up the interior of America for further expansion. And to a certain extent, that is true, and it is definitely a version of the events that actually happened. But it does ignore a significant portion of the things that befell Boone and that he did to himself. For instance, throughout most of the years from 1755 to 1786, Daniel Boone was in almost constant conflict with one group of Native Americans or the other. In 1755, during the French and Indian War, Boone and the unit he was assigned to were attacked and nearly killed by Native American troops. In 1758, Boone and family leave North Carolina for Virginia ahead of a Cherokee uprising. In 1769, he and a friend are on a long hunt in Kentucky when they are captured by a group of Shawnee, stripped of all the skins they had taken, and told never to come back. In 1773, back in Kentucky, Boone's oldest son, off to retrieve supplies for his father's trapping party, is captured, tortured, and killed by a combined group of Delaware, Shawnees, and Cherokees, an event that would spark off Dunmore's War between Virginia and the Shawnee of Ohio County. In 1776, just into the Revolutionary War, Boone's daughter and two other girls are captured and taken north by a war party. Boone follows and drives off to the Shawnee, recovering his daughter. In 1777, Boone is shot in the ankle by another group of Shawnee, attempting to take the fort at Boonesboro, a fort and settlement he helped found. In February of 1778, Chief Blackfish, who led the initial raid on Boonesboro, surprised and captured Boone, who manages to not only talk Blackfish into letting his men surrender, but also talk the men into surrendering, and then further manages to talk the chief into waiting until spring to try taking the fort again, because the people in the fort won't survive the trip back to Blackfish's camp in the winter, and could they all please surrender in the spring instead? Boone escapes in June, races to the fort to warn them the Indians have finally decided to attack, and then fights the Indians again when they eventually turn up later in September. He's court-martialed for what appears to be a severe case of being a traitor, among other things, because Boone apparently never bothered to explain to anyone what was going on or what he thought he was doing in the entire time of his capture. And boy, it sure did seem like he got on awfully well with the Shawnee while he was gone. Oh, and as far as we can find, all the men Boone talked into surrendering to Blackfish remained captured until basically forever. In 1780, back in Virginia, Boone is out hunting with his brother Ned when the Shawnee turn up again and shoot his brother dead. And two years later, Boone in Kentucky again fights in the Battle of Blue Licks against Loyalist and Native American troops who promptly kill his son Israel. Now, we don't know about you, but we're pretty sure we would have taken the hint long before that. Never fear, though, Boone gets out of the Indian fighting game and into politics instead. He's slightly more successful at that, but as a sideline he first got a sniff of after the defense of Boonesboro when he was given $20,000 cash to buy land warrants for new settlers, money which was then stolen from him when he stayed overnight at an inn along the way, he begins speculating in land, buying up large tracts of it in the hopes that it will sell for a much higher price later on. Newsflash, it doesn't. One of the chief reasons being that in order to speculate on land, you have to kind of, sort of, take advantage of both the person selling you the land and the person buying the land, because therein lays the profit. And frankly, Boone just can't bring himself to do that. But he keeps buying up tens of thousands of acres of land at a time anyway, and then losing it all. In fact, the real reason Daniel Boone kept moving away from civilization and into the frontier appears to be because he just wanted to own some land that people wouldn't take away from him to pay off his debts. Almost every move made in his later life was to get away from debts it would then take him years to pay off. By 1798, Boone has been sued over conflicting land claims so often and his land sold off to pay taxes and legal fees so frequently that he just started ignoring the process and eventually a warrant was issued for his arrest for ignoring a summons to testify. Finally, things got so bad he moved to Missouri in 1799. It was owned by the Spanish as part of Spanish Louisiana at the time, but the Spanish were so happy to have him, or anyone really, that he was given land to settle in. Which was great, 
just what Boone wanted, and no one in the United States could take his land from him. Until the Louisiana Purchase from France in 1803, after which Missouri becomes part of the U.S. in 1804, which, because Daniel Boone only had handshake and verbal agreements with the Spanish government, meant he lost all his land again and got nothing for it. Eventually, he petitions the U.S. government to regain his formerly Spanish lands in 1809, but it takes a further five years for that to finally happen, and by then he has to sell it all off again to pay off lingering Kentucky debts. Now, to be fair, as we said, all that stuff about westward expansion, opening up Kentucky, and so on, that's all true. It happened, it was real, and Daniel Boone really did it. No one is saying he didn't. It's just that all this other stuff happened too, and hardly anyone talks about it when they teach you about Daniel Boone. Arguably, including all this makes Daniel Boone a richer, more real historical character. But it also casts a different light on the stories being told about him. But that's not what tall tales are about. Tall tales are much more about capturing the spirit of something, a people, a place, or even just the spirit of the age, a particular point in history. Which is what Timothy Flint did when he wrote his book about Boone. In 1833, after interviewing Daniel Boone, Flint went off and wrote Biographical Memoir of Daniel Boone, the first settler of Kentucky, which became one of the best-selling biographies of the 19th century. And why did it do so well? Because Flint, even though he had interviewed Boone in person himself, lied through his teeth throughout the book about many of the events in Boone's life. Except, since this is a tall tale, he exaggerated through his teeth about the whole thing. Embellished, improved, made it a better story. According to Flint, Boone fights bears barehanded, swings on vines, and generally performs many an astounding feat with alacrity. He has the sharpest senses and the keenest mind of anyone he encounters in the book. He's incredibly shrewd and amazingly resilient to boot, in spite of nearly all the evidence to the contrary. At the point in the book where Boone is captured and held by the Shawnees and is prepared to escape, he's already fasted for three days, and when he makes his break, runs full out for two days, arrives at the fort, and fights for a further ten days, remaining strong, healthy, and alert, in spite of what must by then be fatigue and injuries for multiple wounds sustained in the fighting. And it's this version of events that catches fire and becomes the stories we know best about Daniel Boone. They get retold time and again in dime novels and books for children. They're so full of the feel and foundation of the 19th century American frontier that they become almost the defining version of it. James Fenimore Cooper even takes the Boone stories and models the Leatherstocking Tales after them. The fictional Boone of the Tall Tales has well overshadowed the real Boone. This holds true for other real-life people who become the subject of Tall Tales. Elements of their lives that matter blur and disappear until only the fantastic story remains. Sometimes it's not even possible to tell who the real person behind the story is. Molly Pitcher fought in the American Revolutionary War. She started out as a water bearer for the troops, particularly at the cannon her husband was manning. He was in charge of swabbing the cannon, running a damp sponge down the interior of the barrel to ensure any burning matter left inside was extinguished, before loading the next round. Well, naturally, her husband took a wound in the fighting and was unable to perform his duties, and such was the press of battle that Molly Pitcher had to step up and perform the duties in his place. And so, the story of Molly Pitcher goes, she fought in her husband's stead during the Revolutionary War. A shining example to us all but to women especially. The question is, of course, who was Molly Pitcher? Where did she come from? And here is where the problem begins. See, it is highly likely that Molly Pitcher was a nickname. Since her duties were to ensure water was available to the troops, it's thought that she would have got the nickname from the men calling out, Molly Pitcher! And the name Molly probably wasn't even her real name either, being a common shortened form of a bunch of other names from Margaret to Mary. And one suggestion is a woman named Mary Ludwig Hayes. She fought in the Battle of Monmouth in 1778. Her husband was known to be an artilleryman and was present at Monmouth, and she definitely received a commendation from George Washington for her efforts during the battle. Another possibility was Margaret Corbin, wife of John Corbin. In 1776, at the defense of Fort Washington against 9,000 attacking Hessian troops, 
He was killed at his cannon and she stepped in to take his place until she herself was wounded. The state of Pennsylvania awarded her a $50 annual pension in 1779 for her heroism. So one answer might be that the real Molly Pitcher was either of these two women. But it might also be that Molly Pitcher didn't even exist as such, being instead a sort of collective stand-in for any number of women who took up various arms by various means during the American Revolution. However, it also glosses over the very real contribution made by these people. The symbology is important. The message that everyone has a part to play in the winning of a nation, even an unexpected one, matters. But by the same token, the story of Molly Pitcher gives us an excuse to stop acknowledging the contributions made by all the others. They all became Molly, and we've already heaped our praises on her. But these stories of tall tales were about real people, real men and women doing the hard work of keeping a brand new nation alive and growing. They were held up as examples of what the people of that nation should strive to be and the things they should value. Where things they said and did were inconvenient or uncomfortable, they were glossed over or ignored. It made the stories better, but it also made the people they were about less real. Daniel Boone speculated on land and lost a fortune over and over. He frequently stumbled into misfortune with Native American tribes that ended up costing him sons and brothers and friends. He owed a lot of money to a lot of people and was often only one step ahead of his creditors as he constantly moved further and further afield to avoid them. He was known to keep slaves, and when life in the United States got too hot for him, he left the United States, moved to the Spanish territory, and eventually died there. And sure, it isn't exactly fair to judge Boone through the lens of the modern day, but these aren't the things most people are told about Boone when they learn about him. He still did all the things we were told. He opened the Cumberland Gap and the way into Kentucky, protected and provided for early Western settlers, fought in the American Revolution, entered the government of Virginia, and did sterling service there as much as he could. We're not picking on Boone. It's just that the real picture of Boone is far, far more interesting. And the caricature effect of these tall tales isn't just limited to Boone and Molly Pitcher. Davy Crockett is more famous for being the focus of a Disney TV series in the 50s than he is for the things he actually did while alive, which, on the face of it, seems strangely at odds with the version of Crockett Disney came up with. Mike Fink, king of the keelboaters on the Ohio and Mississippi rivers and occasional guest on the aforementioned Disney show, has received a similar glossing over and sprucing up. Fink was a drunken lout and bully by most contemporary accounts, but modern retellings paint him as a good-natured, jolly folk hero. And John Henry, the steel-driving man, suffers under the same sort of confusion as Molly Pitcher. Exactly who he was is unclear, and where he performed his amazing battle against the steam drill is heavily debated, with at least three separate locations claiming to be the tunnels dug by the man who may have been either a slave, a prisoner, both, or neither. It's the nature of a tall tale about a real historical person to blur the details of who they are and gloss over the less acceptable parts of their nature and history. As a culture, we expect that of a really good tall tale, because the point of one isn't to present a wholly factual account. Instead, tall tales are meant to entertain, yes, but more importantly they are meant to help spread values, ethics, and morals that unify a people around a common set of ideals towards which they are all nominally working so that the society in which they take part can continue to grow and thrive. But what if the tall tale isn't about a real person at all? What if they're about someone you've just totally made up? That's what we'll look at next week. You've been listening to GM Word of the Week, and we very much appreciate that. As always, if you've enjoyed it, share it with someone else who likes good things on the internet. You know, that one friend you have who never forwards you a 10-year out-of-date meme. We're lucky enough to be supported by our patrons on Patreon. That's a pretty incredible feeling to know that people like your work enough to help keep it going. If you'd like to help us do that too, head over to the show webpage at gmwordoftheweek.com and look for the yellow banner at the top to find out how you can. Every dollar helps, and you'll get some neat perks in return. 
international patrons are supported as well. Hello, Scandinavia. This episode was written, researched, and produced by me, Brian Casey. Today's music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. I've never been lost, but I will admit to being confused for several weeks. <laughs>